Good evening, everyone. I'm very delighted to be here. And uh, I'm very grateful to have a chance to talk about my our project about the molecular mapping and characterization of the genetic modifier associated with the Coli anomaly. So, let's start with some introduction. Uh, I come here as a member of the Sylvia Dance. Can you can you hear me now? Better. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I come here as a member of the Sylvia M. Van Sloan uh, Laboratory for Canine uh, Genetics Analysis. Uh, other members are uh, Gustavo Aguirre, you know uh, the, the coordinator, and he's, uh, I he really doesn't need any introduction because Dr. Aguirre's achievement in canine ophthalmology and canine genetics are very numerous. Uh, Jessica is um, our research scientist, and she is uh, in charge of the archive, of the sample gathering, and of the interaction with many breeders, many people that send us samples interact with Jessica. Then we have our new member, Dr. Anil Sigdel, which is a, a, a new, our new postdoc, and is uh, our expert in molecular, uh, molecular genetics and uh, um, uh, molecular statistics. And then there is Lydia Melnick, which is our lab manager and uh, without her many of our uh, many of our projects will never work because it's, she's in charge of the organization. Concerning me, I am Leonardo Luciano and uh, I am Italian actually and I, as many of you could guess from my accent probably. <laughs> And uh, I'm a cellular and molecular biologist. I'm not a vet. And this is something I want to tell you in case you have specific questions concerning the clinical part. For that, maybe it's better to communicate with Dr. Aguirre. But I always work with vets, and I, my interest was always the molecular mapping and characterization of inherited disease in domestic animals. I worked in Switzerland, then I, thanks to a grant I moved to Belgium, and then to the US. And my interest was previously large animals, then I later moved to dogs. And mostly of ophthalmic disease in dogs. So let's start with the, with the meat, <laughs> with the Collie eye anomaly. What is a Collie eye anomaly? It is uh, a layered inherited disease that affects uh, several uh, parts of the eye. The main, uh, the main components are acroidal apoplasia, that's a bit ubiquitous in all the cases, the posterior scleral ectasia and coloboma, and also the chance of retinal detachment. Previous older uh, definition of cholea anomaly also included a tortuosity in the retin retinal vessels. But uh, they don't. This don't belong to modern definitions. The inherited inheritance mechanism is autosomal recessive. We will go on that later. And uh, as I said, the, the disease is also known as cholectasia. And as you probably know, uh, it also affects other breeds. So let's talk about uh, that's look at a couple of slides uh, with phenotypes. Here in these two you can see two uh, cases of mild uh, cholea anomaly, a very um, limited just to, to choroidal acoplasia. You can see this within the pink part, so to speak, on the left and on the right. On the right is already more severe compared to the left. But unfortunately, uh, choroidal, uh, cholea anomaly is not only choroidal apoplasia, and m many dogs uh, uh, develop coloboma. Coloboma also has a significant vari variability in its manifestation, and here again you can see on your left uh, coloboma or a certain severity, and a more severe one on the right. Even uh, even further, you can see that uh, uh, another type of manifestation can be a retinal detachment. 
detachment. <laughs> and the total retinal detachment occurs um, secondary to optic disc coloboma uh, and or uh, peripheral retinal tears. Here you can see within this, uh, you, do, you, do you guys see the, the cursor? Yes. Okay, thank you, sorry, because from this perspective I cannot see the screen, unfortunately. <laughs> and you can see here delimited by these uh, white lines. So, what is a genetic narrative disease? Uh, you, we uh, know about the so-called central drug dogma of biology. The fact that we have genetic information encoded in DNA, the DNA is transcript, transcripted to RNA, and the RNA is translated to protein. Proteins are the building block of our body, or the body of dogs and every creature, and uh, there are also many ways mm, nanomachines, so to speak, microscopic uh, structure that um, carry out several molecular processes. And every time there is something that is going wrong in their structure or in their expression, a genetic disease occurs. Obviously, the narrated part of this whole dogma is the DNA part. That this is what is tested and what we uh, investigate in with a genetic, genetic mapping and molecular characterization. So, a normal and altered gene leads to a normal protein, and a mutated gene, a gene that has an alteration in this uh, sequence, lead to an abnormal protein or to no protein. I am very simplifying this because uh, basically some va genetic variants and mutations don't occur within the gene, but occur in loci in, uh, within the genome that lead to an alteration of the gene expression in any way. But this is less important. There are ways uh, the bad gene, the mutations are inherited, uh, and the simplest mechanisms are autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, and X-linked. What we discuss today is mostly either complex or, auto, if simple, is autosomal recessive. And with autosomal recessive disease, the affected individual has to inherit two different affected alleles from the parents. As you can see here, here you have two affected, two unaffected, and two pair parents that are carriers. So, what is genetic mapping? Genetic mapping means identifying the specific location within a genome, within the whole uh, genetic uh, material of an individual, where the, the causative gene, the causative mutation is located and uh, is um, uh, leading to the pathological condition. Is basically identifying the proper chromosome and the proper position in this chromosome that then will be later explored with other methods. It's basically almost like finding the, per the correct room or the correct aisle within a, a, a library. We know that we are looking for a book, but we have to know where the book is situated. Specifically, Corley anomaly was uh, uh, described several decades ago. Probably the most important similar work is from Seymour Roberts and has been uh, published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology in 1966. But the actual molecular characterization of Corley anomaly um, happened later. And Dr. Aguirre, uh, along with the group of Elena Strander, participated to, to, to it. Oh, sorry, there's a window coming. Okay. These that you, that you see here are the two most important papers that contributed to the characterization of uh, Collier anomaly uh, by Lowe and by Parker. And these are the papers that identified through mapping and then uh, sequencing the deletion that causes uh, Collier anomaly. Very briefly, uh, the linkage uh, consists in the 
identification of informative marker present in the chromosome of uh, cases and controls, and the uh, analysis, uh, the observation of how they are inherited between generations. So uh, the inheritance of this marker that, are, uh, that and then is associated with the presence or absence of a pathological condition is what leads to the um, identification of the specific locus, the specific position where this variant can, have, can exist. Uh, linkage is still used for um, molecular mapping and characterization of genetic disease, but in, uh, there are also modern methods that can be more useful and powerful. <coughs> So, a small introduction to polygenic disease. We say that uh, there are diseases that are simply inherited, okay? So, just a single allele, a single uh, genetic uh, variant is sufficient for an autosomal dominant. Two copies are required for a, for a recessive one. Well, there are some diseases that don't work quite like that. They need a combination of several factors, possibly located in different regions of the genome, to lead to a specific phenotype. So what we think about coloboma in collies is that as a polygenic component, that you need at least, in the very least, two different hits, two different genetic mutations in order to have the phenotype. So, if there is uh, some um, inconsistency in the way we observe it, right? We don't, we don't, we cannot follow very well how it manifests in a litter. Uh, we kind, we can kind of infer that certain dogs can lead to more cases, okay? But it's not a clear cut and extremely predictable inheritance uh, like uh, a simple autosomal recessive. And here is this representation. It's like, like being on a scale, basically. And the, the manifestation of the phenotype consists in uh, the accumulation in the critical position of the genome of positive genes, or to better say, positive genetic variants, or negative ones. If the scale is tipped in the right direction, you maybe can have a, um, two copies of the Collier anomalous mutation, but just a very mild choroidal hypoplasia. Uh, but if you have an accumulation of neg negative factors, maybe at least just one, or maybe more, you will have a coloboma. So the controls of polygenic disease uh, has been actually approached with conventional methods by breeders. And uh, the selection response equals the intensity and the accuracy and the genetic variation uh, uh, by the generation interval. The intensity is a fraction uh, uh, kept as parents, few parents greater response. The accuracy is how well the genetic merit of animals is estimated, the genetic variation, greater variation, greater response, and the generation interval, um, the average age of the parent, the longer the interval, the slower the change. This, this approach has been very successful, um, but sometimes has been um, discouraged by veterinary ophthalmologists. So a few number, you can see that uh, the, uh, this is uh, see here RF data, at least uh, what you see here in this bracket. And 91, uh, 1998, and 2008, you see the increasing maybe in the uh, prevalence of coronal hypoplasia, but a decrease in coloboma. And a kind of a flip flopping or retinal detachment, I would say. And then historically, probably the coronal hypoplasia was around 90% in coloboma 2025. And I have to say that the last ACVO book reports an incidence of CEA uh, by 75% and coloboma 9.2. And I have to report a note by Dr. Aguirre that said that many records um, are insent and perhaps lead to an underestimation of the actual prevalence. So uh, 
why we are proposing this study, why we are saying we should find a marker. Well, we think that a marker will give us control on what we have. Then what we will do with this control is up to, to the breeder. So our lab, the Silver Pounds Law, has a workflow that uh, starts with the uh, interaction with the uh, club and registers, the breeders and the pet owners, uh, and then a collection of samples and medical records, uh, archivation of these samples, and then extraction of DNA and uh, wet lab uh, analysis. And finally, genetic mapping and whole genome sequencing. Uh, so there is basically uh, a whole flow from the wet lab up to the uh, informatic part. A note, uh, this is something I had the last minute interacting with people today actually. Uh, I want to say that the way we treat the samples is completely unknown. I have the name of the dogs and this is something maybe is important to remember. So, what I, we talked about genetic mappings. How mapping is carried out nowadays? There are several methods, but generally are, are based on markers. Okay, and these markers are uh, specific position within the genome, thousands of them for every chromosome, and uh, they are um, they have been selected by um, observation of the population, and are uh, basically uh, based on a fluorescent technology. Each of these marker is present uh, in, um, uh, in couple, of course, because there are two kind chromosome, and um, they are essential for a recognition of the um, of shared ancestry between dogs or inheritance of specific uh, chromosomal regions between parents and offspring and uh, they are used for uh, as an example of mosaicosity mapping if i am investigating a recessive disease i can look thanks to these snip chip markers where every um, case is homozygous where these homozygous regions within the genome are shared with other case and when controls are not homozygous and then we can focus on this region and see if there is some mutation that is uh, pos potentially causative. Nonetheless, probably the most powerful uh, methods for genetic mapping is the GWAS, the genome-wide association. <coughs> How does it work? A number of cases is selected and a number of controls from the population. And then, a this uh, input of genotype dogs is compared. The two groups are compared one against the other. And each marker for each position within the chromosome is um, analyzed by a software. And the markers that are the most frequent in the cases, and not in the controls, are considered the most associated. The result, the graphical result for this analysis, what we call a Manhattan plot, because basically the um, output is something that reminded the people that came out with this method to the um, cityscape of Manhattan. <laughs> and you can see here, I will explain better later this graph, but basically each ever and every um, a little colored thing you see here is a chromosome. And all those markers are arranged by position. And when we see a signal here, we know that in this chromosome, we will have something that is interesting. In this case, the sample I can show you here is actually our um, redoing of the genetic mapping of our Collier anomaly with our preliminary data. And this was done with just 30 dogs, I think, it was very simple because this the inheritance is uh, simple Mendelian, uh, recessive. So we took 10 coloboma dogs, 10 dogs with colia anomaly but no coloboma, and then 10 controls. And here we go. 
and I speak in the Manhattan plot. What you see here instead are other two undisclosed results for other projects in our lab. And you can see that these are very nice, this is the good stuff, these are very nice uh, results, a huge peak, there is no ambiguity here. I know very well where I'm going to look at. And in fact, we joke that this more than Manhattan plots are Dubai plot. <laughs> <laughs> but even with a more timid peak, so to speak, we can still have a look and see how, how the, the variants segregate. So the next step after this mapping is going with whole genome sequencing. What is whole genome sequencing? Well, I am quite privileged because people before me didn't have this kind of tool. Every time they suspected a the region of the genome and thought, hey, maybe there is something over there, they had to manually go for every single gene and then sequence truly. It was quite lab labor intensive. What we can do nowadays is to uh, basically get the DNA of a suitable candidate, fragment it, and insert it into a machine that can then tag this fragment DNA and read it. And each and every read then will be bioinformatically processed and aligned against a reference. This reference is basically a dog that has been a read sequence before. And what the informatic workflow will do, it will say, okay, we have a reference dog, we have our dog, let's see how much our dog is different from that dog. And a lot of these differences will be possibly mutations that then could be among, among these, there is, there is the causative one. Okay, now this method is very powerful when you combine it with the mapping. Because I don't need, if I know where I have to look at, I'm not going to waste time searching for the whole genome of the dog. I have that chromosome, the little interval, I will just jump there and very quickly find the variant. I, uh, talking with people today, I, I reported some anecdote. Recently it happened to me to map uh, um, uh, inherited disease with only four dogs. <laughs> Two cases, two controls, whole genome sequencing. But that was a, a very simple Mendelian inheritance, a very blatant candidate gene, and a very devastating mutation. One is not always that lucky, unfortunately. Especially if there is uh, perhaps a complex phenotype and there are maybe more regulatory mutations. Uh, but I wanted to show you this, this picture here because is an example of an output whole genome sequencing. And this affects you guys directly. Because, uh, you know, on top here, you have a dog without the Coli eye anomaly genetic variant. All these little gray things that you see here are the equivalent of those fragments of DNA that has been read by the machine. And they have been aligned against the reference. And this is a little part of this NHEJ1 gene. This is associated with the anomaly. And if I show you this, you can see that there is a whole fragment of the gene that is missing. There is nothing here. And this is the deletion that you guys uh, test for. So there can be different type of comparison with this whole gen um, general Y association, sorry. You can have a standard mapping, hunting for um, simply inherited disease, so you have cases against controls. You uh, gather all the uh, dogs that are affected, and all the dogs that are normal, and compare them one against the other group. In case of Collier anomaly, in our remapping, so to speak, to confirm our chromosome 27 um, uh, peak here, we gather together dogs with just Collier anomaly and dogs with Collier anomaly and coloboma against controls. But what we have to do to find a genetic marker or mutation for coloboma is a bit different. 
What we have to do is to compare coloboma cases against coli anomaly without coloboma dogs. Those are our controls. Because we have to be sure that what we observe that is different between the coloboma and the coli and coronal hypoplasia dogs are markers, are genetic mutations that are exclusive for coloboma. And here maybe I can elaborate on that introduces what is so-called epistasis, that is an effect on the expression of a gene or manifestation of a phenotype caused maybe that by a mutation by another uh, gene and another uh, locus on the another position in the genome. Just imagine the situation. I am making this example just with a random chromosome. But here we have chromosome 37, which is the chromosome where your coli anomaly mutation is located. And maybe we have a dog here that doesn't have the, the coli uh, mutation. is free, has been tested, is fine. But maybe he has a mutation that is causing coloboma. But we are never going to see that because the first hit, the coli anomaly mutation, is, is not there. But what about this? Now we have a dog that has the mutation in chromosome 37, also like the first dog has a mutation in, in this other chromosome. Again, this other chromosome is an example. Now the scale is tipped and we have a severe coloboma. And maybe this can happen within the same family. This is why maybe you can see coloboma popping. Now, there is also another option that you have a dog that has uh, the chromosome 37 mutation, but not the coloboma mutation or mutations. And that would be one of our um, uh, coronal apoplasia examples shown before. So how would it proceed here? We took, uh, initially, we started with a very small data set of uh, 10 uh, coronary apoplasia dog, 10 colobomas, and 10 normal. And we carry out this preliminary association. But then, thanks to the Collie Health, we gather 39 coloboma and 69 uh, coronary apoplasia dogs. And this led us to uh, run several statistical methods and strategies for the hunt for the second gene, the second hit, the second mutation. Here you can see our pre preliminary analysis confirming the, uh, the mapping on chromosome 37 of the CEA mutation. Why I show you this graph again a bit? Because I wanted to show you more in detail this Manhattan plot, each chromosome, this is the beginning and the end of each chromosome, and each little dot that you see is a marker. And each marker has been compared with in case and control. So the more you see a marker going up here, the stronger is the association, and the stronger will be the linkage of that marker with the causative variant. But also because, I'm oh sorry, uh, yeah, because I wanted to show you that um, when such type of analysis is carried out, we also try to set a threshold. We say, okay, if the signal is this high, we can be confident about what we see. Consider that the scale here depend, means that every thick that we go, like four to five, five to six, means that I'm 10 times more confident. So. Increasing the confidence by one here means that we are 10 times more um, sure about what we are seeing. This is unfortunately what we found preliminary with our coloboma mapping at the end. We had this uh, high confident bar that we put, but each and every association we found so far is weak, is suggestive, it's not a yes, it's a maybe. 
Maybe we are getting there, but so far we are a bit distant. And this makes me uh, go to the, this last part of this presentation, which is, in my opinion, is most, most critical, especially uh, after um, I had the, the chance of very productively speaking with many people today. And is related to the importance of power of an experiment. What gives us, give us power? Power, a lot of times, is just uh, connected to the number of samples we use, how many cases and controls are invested. Here is an example, is another inherited disease we dealt with. Uh, on your um, left, you see an association carried out with our initial data set. And we had a nice trend, okay? But then, thanks to the, the owner and the owners, we managed to gather double the samples, okay, we had before. And the result was that our signal here, that you see, this association went all up. And one interval and something. And this means that with twice the samples, we now have 10 times more the confidence about that interval. And this is important. Remember, with just one tick here is 10 times more. It can be deceptive, maybe, the, the graphic. And this shows that gathering samples and increasing the power of the experiment is absolutely crucial to, to, to find what we are looking for. So what can we do to have a good data set? Well, many things. Uh, I, I, we can say a data set is only as good as the input data that we use to build. And we, what we have to absolutely, positively avoid is to have a situation in which we have garbage in and garbage out. <laughs> Because if we insert in our computer analysis, statistical models, data that is flowed in a way or another, we are never going to get what we want. So we have to avoid it. And we, have, we can do it with now increasing the numbers, having a very clear phenotype. We have to know and be positive that this is a coloboma, this is a cholea, etc. And then also uh, improve the, the information available about the, the, the family of each sample. Concerning the phenotype, so <coughs> uh, some of the data we received was a bit partial about the phenotype. Uh, Roberts, the, the paper that I cited as seminal for the, for the Koya anomaly, uh, originally assigned um, a severity from a scale to, uh, from one to five. But uh, even today, if uh, the, the reports that we received, all of them and had a classification of mild, moderate, and severe, it would help immensely. It would be absolutely a, a great support for what we do. So that's something I, I really want to stress. Another important thing is um, family tree information. Why? Well, for several reasons. Mm, generally, I, I've been, I, I, I describe in a very genetic, generic way uh, our association analysis and genetic mappings, but there are several methods, okay? Some of them could be family-based, some other instead are based on the assumption that the dogs you select for your statistics are the least related as possible, okay? But these two things share something in common. I have to know how much the dogs are related. Because if I know that the dogs are analyzing are related, well, that's great. But I know that these two guys are related, these two guys are related, these two guys are cases and controls, and I will adjust my input base of that. Otherwise, I will uh, select very uh, strictly only dogs that are very distant one from the other and run a different analysis. And then 
I will be able to uh, avoid any so-called confounding factor that the fact that the dogs are related with each other introduces inside the experiment. So both strategies are valid, and we we'll probably use both, <laughs> okay, because we will use all the methods, all the uh, weapons that we have, but we have to know. So when it's possible that we will have to, to ask people to um, send family information pedigree or find a way to, to retrieve maybe some information from samples previously sent. So all of this basically is to lead to a filtering mechanism to create a sample pool create a mapping uh, and uh, a data set that's suitable for the mapping with general association with clean data. Then add whole genome sequencing uh, to be used on the uh, mapped candidate regions. And then finally a selection of a final marker that will be tested on every dog that has been submitted to us. And how these mar candidate markers will segregate, will be distributed, will make us conclude how good is the mutation that we find and how um, uh, suitable is a Coloboma candidate. Uh, this is also a bit oversimplified, I have to say, because um, the methods that I, uh, I am shown today can be also combined with each other, okay? This is something that we just started to do, but uh, <coughs> holding on sequencing as an example, when I started years ago in, uh, in Switzerland with my um, uh, cattle genomics, we had to pay the equivalent, well, Swiss francs and dollars more or less were on the same. So I had to say $7,000 for one genome, okay? Nowadays, some company makes me pay 1,100, $1, okay? And some method can lead to genomes of $700 or cost, okay? You see that begin and end at this period of my career, the 10 times uh, less the cost. This is very important because it means that uh, the good, high-quality samples that we can gather, we, they can be whole genome sequenced. And this means that instead of looking for linked markers, for markers that are just connected through the causative variant, we can just uh, directly hunt for the causative variant. We can just sequence as many dogs as possible and then compare the data and find what we are looking for. But in order to do so, to don't waste time and money, frankly, we need good quality samples, good exams, good family information, good reports. So our so my voice, so our goal is the removal of the most deleterious genetic variant from the poll. Tip the scale, basically and give you the power, the, the, the control over what you are breeding. In order to do so, we need data of good quality. And by the way, uh, also speaking with people today, this is also this age part, this uh, last minute addition. I noticed that um, some people had a discrepancy uh, in the uh, diagnosis of very young dogs that later came out as uh, affected by coloboma. This is something that I, I will have to, to take a very hard look at my own data set and see what I can adjust and filter out. But I think that this is also something that everyone among that submits sample must think about. Then the sample number is absolutely critical and I really ask you to keep them coming. Uh, and also something, I, I uh, talk with people these two days, and I think that for someone there was a misconception that we were only hunting for coloboma samples. Absolutely not. We hunt for both coloboma and coli anomaly without coloboma. 
because they are the two parts of our association study, of our experiment. And then uh, I want just to, to say that I'm very thankful and uh, to remind you that this is a continuous collaborative effort between us and the breeders. Uh, so I, uh, I hope I didn't go too fast through this, this information and I can tell you that uh, I'm open to any question to elaborate anything that I show you. Uh, I want to really thank you for this. with complex traits include as an additional information so called covariate the intensity of the phenotype okay so in order to exploit these mathematical models that include the intensity we need that intensity scale otherwise we are just having a yes or no phenotype and, and that's hard for us yeah. I, and I, I, I wanted to know how bad it was and it's not that great to be honest. And I think that that's uh, veterinary ophthalmologists must be uh, made uh, aware of this. And this is something that I will never be tired of saying. Um, could you please repeat the question when someone asks you the question? Right. Sorry, because there is. So, uh, absolutely. So, as been asked, uh, as been said previously, veterinarian ophthalmologists use actually to grade the phenotype, okay? But this doesn't happen anymore. And uh, is this critical? Yes, it is. And we should absolutely push for them to grade the, the, the phenotypes of any, just to not write call AI anomaly and be done with it. Uh, and I say this because uh, it can be uh, important for us to tell a part, I guess, about, from a control and also to uh, discern several level of, of, of severity that can be used as a covariate, so as a, an additional information in our statistical studies. As breeders, who should we be petitioning or, or insisting to? They go back to a numerical rate. Okay, so, okay, so she was asking who should we petition that the ophthalmologists go back to that grading system? Yeah, this is a good question. I think that. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, sorry. Uh, as been said, who, who should we uh, push? Who should we. Um, talk with in order to sensibilize veterinary ophthalmologists into grade better the phenotype. I think that uh, it could start of a, on a personal, let's say, in, in interaction level, but probably uh, should be something on, on, a, on a club level, but it's, it's unfortunately beyond my, my control. <laughs> it's, How, it's did it get How did the numerical ratings go away? Uh, how the, uh, the rating went away. Uh, you made that decision. Okay, thank you. So what happened is, what happened is they came up with 
the um, surf forms and everybody wanted to use the surf forms. So there was really no place for them to mark grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, grade five, write comments. And so they just stopped it. And, and I think that's really what happened to the Robert system, which was the graded system. Um, I've been doing this for 50 years, so I had most of my pup puppies back 50, 40, 30 years ago were by the Robert system. I have to say that the, the form is still an open space for comments, so if the vet is really will, willing, cool, great, anyway, cool to write a couple of lines and, and great, to be honest. Maybe what we can do as breeders is ask for them to say mild, medium, or extreme, or something like that for the uh, paling area the uh, corridor hydroplasia to say how big it is and um, that would be equivalent to the one or the two in the Robert system. Taking, uh, taking it into account when we write our statistical model, okay, but the dog with the coloboma in just one eye is a case for us and it's very important anyway. So if you have just one eye, please send. But yes, it's taken into account when we run the specific analysis, the details of the analysis. All right, can we have a round of applause for Dr. Murphy? Okay, so we're going to do real quickly. Um, I'm going to first ask my um, Kali Health Foundation officers to stand. I know you can stand. I know I know it's hard after we've been on cement, but okay. And can we now have the board of directors stand? Which means the officers too, you should have stayed standing. <laughs> okay. Now